Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. S1 Labels and Packaging is extremely excited to be part of the DScoop Edge Fusion once again, and it is off to a great start already. Over the past couple of years, we have witnessed quite a few label converters start to offer flexible packaging. As a matter of fact, there's a session tomorrow called A Practical Guide to Start Your Flexible Packaging Journey that is all about helping label converters move into the flex pack arena. Make sure you don't miss it. The presentation we're giving today is also in that spirit, and we hope you will find it useful whether you are just considering to offer FlexPack or are already fully immersed. I'm Tom Hauenstein, Vice President of S1 Labels and Packaging. For those unfamiliar with our company, we offer a multitude of different solutions for label and FlexPack converters, both digital and conventional, such as FlexPack films, including our compostable and recyclable offerings, Michaelman Indigo primers, and barrier coatings. FlexPack finish, uh, finishing equipment, and a full array of water-based and energy cure coatings. So let's get started. So why get into FlexPack in the first place? Well, as you can see, flexible packaging is a growing space. You're seeing a lot of different brands or different types of products move from rigids to flexibles. I think the most common example that you might be familiar with is baby food. When I was younger and when my kids were younger, it was still offered in glass jars. Now you'd be hard pressed to find baby food in glass jars and it's typically offered in a flexible packaging product like a pouch with a spout on top of it. But why do they do that? Well, first, in order to get heavy glass from point A to point B, it costs a lot of money. So there's a sustainable aspect to it, less fuel involved to get it from point A to point B. And then the other is lost due to damage right? Or even the danger of getting broken glass in baby food. That would be a bad situation. So by moving to a flexible package, even if a crate were to spill that had a bunch of that product in there, it wouldn't shatter. It would still be usable product and you wouldn't have any issues with a piece of glass getting into baby food. So flexibles are growing in the whole space of packaging. Packaging and flexible packaging in and of itself is a growing market. The global 2022 projection for FlexPack is $131 billion. That's next year, $131 billion in flexible packaging. And it has a compound annual growth rate of 5.2% from 2017 to 2022. So packaging is growing. Flexibles are becoming more and more common in the food space and in many other spaces as well. And then the third reason you might want to get into flexible packaging, and this is a really big one for everybody today because it speaks about digital, is the fact that only 1% to 2% of all packaging created today is done digitally. We suspect that about 10 to 15% of packaging in the next 5 to 10 years will be done digitally. That's billions of dollars. If you take that $131 billion and you take 10 to 15% of that, that is billions of dollars moving into the digital flex pack space over the next five to 10 years. And being that you guys know digital and you could be on the leading edge of that, that is a lot of financial windfall that you would be making yourself uh, accessible to by moving into digital flexible packaging now as it's in its infancy. So another great reason, and we you may hear this on some of the forums, is your the, the beauty of being in an emerging market as opposed to a mature market or declining market. First, there's less competition. There's not a lot of people out there doing digital flexible packaging. So you're not going to run into a lot of competition on pricing or lead times or anything like that in an emerging market as you would compared to, again, a mature or declining market. Higher margins. Uh, your markup on flexible packaging, digital flexible packaging would be even larger than digital labels, for example, uh, as far as percentage. So that's a huge opportunity in an emerging market. And then finally, there's growing supply chain support. The supply chain was set up to support the wide web converters, the big guys, uh, and that that supply chain is maturing, and we're trying to be part of that maturation process by offering smaller MOQs and quick lead times that are required to be successful in the digital world. So what we've witnessed is basically three different waves of people moving into that digital flex pack space. Now that we've talked about why you want to get in there, let me tell you a little bit about the story of what brings us to speed or what brings us up to date today. 
So the first people to really jump into, let's say, purchasing an Indigo 20,000 and, and trying to offer digital flexible packaging were the wide web converters. These are the guys that had massive CBGs, CPGs like your Mars and PepsiCo, those companies like that. And what you'll see is some of those large wide web converters jumped in, dedicated a whole sales team to selling digital flexible packaging and really have taken off. But some of them didn't do that. And they've struggled to really get that digital flex pack portion of their business off the ground. So that was the first wave. Those are the first people that we saw jump into this space. The second wave are your early adopters and your innovators. Obviously, everybody knows EPAC and they are taking the world by storm. Uh, and then we see some green fields, people that came from different industries or different or slightly related industries and started a new business from the ground up. Uh, that would be like your go packs in Wisconsin and AccuFlex in North Carolina. These are guys that understood where the market was going and pounced on that opportunity to create that business model. And they're seeing amazing growth by doing that. So those are the first two waves. And the third wave we're right in the midst of now and it's starting to happen is the label converter moving into the flex pack space. Uh, we have some, some of our customers are doing this now, like your Edwards label, your innovative labeling solutions, Kala out in Utah. Uh, they understood the opportunity as well. They're familiar with the Indigo platform and it just made sense for them to start offering flexible packaging. And so what we're trying to do is help those label converters move in the flexible packaging space space in a smart and efficient and a safe way. However, there are some equipment gaps. You can't use your label finisher to create pouches, for example. And as far as protecting inks and finishing, that's another issue that you will need to discuss as well. So when we talk about pouching or creating a stand-up pouch or a sachet or something like that, Pouching is an art form. I think if you talk to anybody uh, doing flexible packaging, digital or conventional, they'll tell you that pouching is an art form, especially with all the new different types of materials that are out in the marketplace as far as recyclable materials or compostable materials that may need to be run at different temperatures or different speeds to get good seals, hermetic seals. So that is a big issue and that's a big struggle for a lot of people just getting off the ground. And since it is such an art form, it really makes sense to take the approach of outsourcing your packaging or your pouching to start. There's a lot of other things that you need to learn in order to get into flexible packaging. So it might make sense to outsource that for a while to somebody that's an expert at it. And then once you start getting a book of business and get all the other parts of the business under control and have a good wrap around it and understand it, that's the time that you start considering bringing in your own pouching line. And then you can control your lead times better. You can control a lot of different things better. You can throw rush jobs in there. So bringing it in-house down the road makes sense and outsourcing at first. Now, finishing is a completely different animal. So finishing um, is how do you protect the inks? What a label converter typically does is they'll do self-wound pressure sensitive or they'll do like a UV coating. And we're going to talk about why that's not really an option in flexible packaging, especially for anything ingested like food uh, or cannabis or even pet food or something like that. There are some dangers there. So that's the biggest gap. And that's what we're, that's the crux of the presentation today is on the finishing side. What are the options out there for the label converter to move into flexible packaging? What finishing options exist? And what are the best ones that they should be considering? So here are all the different options, and we'll go through each of these one by one, but you have adhesive lamination, extrusion lamination, e-beam coating, self-wound pressure sensitive, UV lamination, overprint varnishes or coatings, and thermal lamination. So let's kind of take them one by one. We'll talk about the positives and negatives of each one. And then you can kind of understand what might be the best, best path for you and your business as you're moving into that flexible packaging space. So the first one we're gonna talk about is adhesive lamination. This is wet adhesive. There's a ton of different types of chemistries that you can use in there. Water-based, solvent, solventless, by far, the most common way to produce flexible packaging is solventless lamination. It's pretty much the gold standard. It's a proven method to do that. You can use it for flow wraps, such as roll stock or snack webs. You can use it for stand-up pouches. It really does a good job of taking two different types of plastic, like a polyethylene and a polyester, and marrying them together. Uh, since it's proven, you know, there's a lot of confidence in that chemistry and the way it works, but it's an art form as well. 
you, because on a solventless adhesive, for example, it's a two-part adhesive. So you have to manage the ratios of part A to part B and make sure they're completely in line. And your coat weight needs to be perfect too. If any of those things are out of whack, your coat weight goes too low or your ratios get a little bit skewed up, you're going to find when you go to slit that you're slicing out a lot of bad material. So that is really where slitting becomes a, a really important step with solventless lamination because on the solventless laminator, you got to flag where the material goes out of spec. And then once you go in to slit that material, you got to splice out the bad part, splice back in the good part. So that's that's the downside of solventless lamination. But I think the biggest issue with solventless lamination is our whole Amazon world that we live in today, right? So everybody wants everything tomorrow. So with speed to market, that's going to be a big issue for a lot of people out there is um, solventless adhesives, they take sometimes anywhere from two to seven days to fully cure. So that means that you would have a bunch of material that is tied up, just waiting for it to be cured. And then after two to seven days, then you can start slitting and pouching. So there are other finishing methods out there that allow you to go right from finishing, right to slitting, right to pouching and out the door. So you get that fast food world that we live in today where I ordered it today, I want it tomorrow. Five years ago, 10 years ago, going from artwork to pouching in 24 hours was absolutely unheard of. Typically, it was a 45 to 60 day lead time from artwork to actually getting pouches delivered. Now, a 24 hour turnaround time is possible with some of these other finishing methods. So that's kind of some of the positives and negatives of solventless adhesive lamination. The next type of lamination we're going to talk about is extrusion lamination. Extrusion lamination is not unsimilar to solventless lamination, but instead of taking a two-part wet adhesive and putting it together between two layers of film, you're actually making a molten level, molten layer of plastic. So you, in this situation that you see on the graphic, you're taking low-density polyethylene and you're heating it up so it becomes basically liquid and flows out of an extrusion like slot die machine, and it lays it down and it marries two pieces of uh, material together. Extrusion lamination, I've never seen in a digital pouch factory in the market ever. Uh, the reason is the cost of it is really high, and it really is set up to do really, really long runs of one type of substrate, which obviously flies in the face of digital, where we have lower MOQs or skew proliferation, where you, know, you want 40,000 of the same size pouch, but you want 10 different pieces of artwork in that, and that's your skew proliferation. doesn't really make sense for extrusion lamination there. The best thing about extrusion lamination is it really holds up to anything caustic going into the package. So you see extrusion lamination is made to make cosmetic webs where you're actually marrying, let's say, polyester to a layer of foil for extreme barrier, then to a layer of low linear density polyethylene. If you were to put a shampoo or sunscreen or conditioner or some sort of cosmetic into a solventless laminated structure, the contents of that package can actually work their way through your sealant layer, your polyethylene layer, to the adhesive and start to eat away at that adhesive and you would get failure in the field, which typically manifests itself as a delamination. So that's where extrusion lamination comes in because you're taking that molten plastic kind of like a hot glue gun and you're melting it between those two layers. Then you're going to get that really good anchorage. And no matter what's in there, whether it's something acidic like ketchup or, or those shampoos or sunscreens, won't be able to deteriorate the lamination layer, the adhesive layer, and it'll hold up over a long period of time. That's why they're called cosmetic webs is because they're designed for cosmetics and those types of products. So again, not something that I really think any digital flexible packaging person would consider as a finishing option, but it is out there in pre-made or pre-fabricated or as we call pre-laminated structures for those cosmetics. The next one is E-beam coating. If you're not familiar with E-beam, um, it's been around for a while. It's used in a bunch of different industries, and it's really starting to gain traction in the flexible packaging world. Uh, E-beam lamination, or I'm sorry, E-beam coating is like UV coating. It's an energy cured process, but instead of UV light waves hitting a photo initiator in your coating and causing that to create cross-linking and making it solid, it fires electrons at the speed of light through a vacuum through the coating, and the electrons actually create the cross-link. That's really important for a couple different reasons. First, the way that E-beams work compared to UV is that it's instant cure, and it's almost 100% cure every single time. With UV, 
it's different. If your lamp, your UV lamp on your UV lamination system or your UV coating system starts to get old, then your cure rate is going to drop. Or if your reflectors around that UV light start to get dirty or contaminated, then your, then your uh, cure rate will drop. Or if the operator comes in and instead of running at 120 feet per minute, decides to run at 140 feet per minute, less dwell time under that UV lamp, and the cure rate will drop. Uncured UV coating is really bad. The photo initiators can be free radicals and migrate in and out of the package and into the food or the cannabis or whatever you're putting into, into it and cause contamination, which is really bad. With e-beam, no matter how fast you run it, it is putting the same amount of electron dosage through that package. So it understands it's like, oh, if I'm running at 50 feet per minute, I need to be firing at this much to get 100 or 98% cure rate. Or if I'm at 100, I need to do this dosage. So the dosage is consistent regardless of run speed because that, that thought process and that intellectual approach to it is already built into the machine. But of course, I mean, this sounds great, right? It's like, why isn't everybody doing e-beam? Well, there's a downside to it. And typically it's cost related. An e-beam machine, depending on the manufacturer you choose and the options that you uh, go for on that can run anywhere from 900,000 to 1.5 million. So it's certainly an investment that you have to be committed to and have a really good business plan in order to come out of the red and into the black uh, with your business when it comes to find uh flexible packaging. The next type of finishing is thermal lamination. Now, I think all of us are familiar with thermal lamination. It's been around forever. You've probably seen thermally encapsulated menus at restaurants or ID cards at school. It's been around forever, but it hasn't been around forever in the flexible packaging space. Uh, thermal lamination, there's uh, obviously HP and Carvel have the great HP Pack Ready solution, and there are a ton of installs globally, and they're having great success with thermal lamination, which I think is a testament to it being a good fit for digital flexible packaging. You could do just about any application, stand-up pouches, flow wrap, all the typical um, flexible packaging products can be done with thermal lamination. Uh, it is fast curing. So on these thermal laminators, like from Carvel, we offer one and we'll get to that in a minute. There's a chill roll system after the thermal lamination process so that it cools down the web. And once that web cools down, that adhesive is rock solid, ready for slitting, ready for pouching. So you could go right from thermal lamination, right to slitting and pouching and out the door. That is a huge, huge advantage that uh, other finishing methods don't offer. The downside to thermal lamination, um, there are a couple. One, there's no real compostable thermal adhesive out there. So if your whole goal is to go after home compostable or industrial compostable products, because that's the whole way the world is going, is the sustainable uh, wave, is, is it's a tidal wave at this point. Um, you're going to struggle to offer compostable. You can offer recyclable. You can offer classic mixed plastics. Um, and you can obviously go sustainable in different ways by using, you know, plastics that have been coming from the recycle stream. Um, but you won't be able to do compostable. The, oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. I went forward on the on the slide deck. I wasn't quite done talking about thermal lamination. Thermal lamination is more cost effective than e-beam. Typically, it's about 25 to 30% the cost of an e-beam. So that is palatable when you're looking at a finishing option as well. And then we're going to get into a couple more options for you as far as finishing. But one last thing on thermal lamination is that one of the biggest things that you're going to have to manage is the sealant layer on your packaging and the temperatures it takes to seal the sealant layer versus the temperature it takes to thermally laminate. Typically a sealant will start to seal at about 250 degrees Fahrenheit, where the thermal adhesive on your laminator activates at about, let's say 210, 220 degrees, depending on the coat weight and what resin is being used. Um, so that's gonna be the challenge is, is understanding that I wanna run it hot enough to activate my thermal adhesive on my laminate but not so hot that I activate the sealant layer. If you were to activate the sealant layer on your packaging, then you probably get low linear density polyethylene goo all over your roller assembly as it's going through uh, your thermal laminator. And also if you don't have enough temperature, then you probably will get low lamination bond strengths and you would get a delamination issue with thermal lamination. 
So here are some other options that a label converter could certainly consider. And these don't require any type of purchase in a new piece of capital equipment. And we'll kind of go through the upsides and downsides on these. And I think you'll see that on most of these, the downsides will make you come to the conclusion that a piece of capital equipment is a way to go for finishing. But there are some things you could do to kickstart your business now and get into flexible packaging now as a little bit of a Band-Aid or a bridge until you want to make that investment. Obviously, outsourcing is one of those. There's a ton of different flexible packaging partners out there that could do that finishing for you and the pouching. So if you're sending pouching off to outsource anyway, you could feasibly just print and rewind, send it off to somebody, and they could do their own finishing technique before pouching for you, of course, at a cost. So you could do toll lamination and then toll pouching or toll e-beam coating and then toll pouching. So the three options that obviously a label finisher is set up to do today is self-wound pressure sensitive lamination, UV lamination, or water-based overprint varnishes. When you look at self-wound pressure-sensitive adhesive lamination, the biggest downside to that is that pressure-sensitive adhesives at higher temperatures really start to flow. And you need higher temperatures to make that pouch. Specifically, let's say if you're adding a zipper into a pouch, a press to close zipper or a slide zipper, it requires a ton of heat and pressure to get that zipper to stick into the sealant area and not come back out. I think we've all had some sort of package where that zipper wasn't fully inserted properly and you go to open the package and the zipper sticks to one side and you've just ripped off the package to the other side. And then it's almost impossible to get in and out of that package easily. You want to avoid that. And the way you avoid that is by adding a ton of heat and pressure. So going back to the self wound pressure sensitive adhesive, if you're putting it under that amount of heat and pressure, that adhesive starts to flow. And what you could get is it starts to move a little bit and it starts to delam a lot. You could do it. And I know that there's companies out there that are successfully employing uh, self wound pressure sensitive. There are FDA versions of these laminates out there for you. That's really important to get an FDA version of them. Um, but what you might get is a lot of rejects on your pouching. Um, or reprint jobs. And those are really expensive and those create a bad customer experience. And that's why we kind of tend to push customers away from pressure sensitive uh, lamination. UV lamination, I think I touched on this earlier. Um, when you're using UV, there's photo initiators in there. Those are bad. Uh, you can't control the cure weight. So really, there's an issue with that. Now you could say it doesn't matter because I have a ton of barrier in my substrate. So even if it wasn't fully cured, there would be no way for anything bad in that UV adhesive to make it through that barrier. Let's say it's a cosmetic web with a thick layer foil. You're right, but what it could go this way through your 48 gauge polyester or 70 gauge uh, polypropylene, for example. It could go out the front and then get backside transfer to your sealant web on the next wrap when you're going to rewind. So there's the issue with UV lamination is you can put all the barrier you want on one side, but you can't control what it does on the opposite side. So it's always a position at S1LP to put our customers in the best position to be successful. And part of that is being safe. And we just don't see there's too many risks involved with UV lamination. Again, there are people out there that are doing it and have a lot of processes in in place to make sure they're not doing anything dangerous, but it seems like there are a lot better finishing options out there that just remove that risk completely, like e-beam and thermal lamination. The last one that you could do today would be water-based overprint varnishes. If you have a label finisher with a flexo deck that has hot air delivery to run water-based overprint varnishes, then you can start offering pouching today. It's important that you select an overprint varnish that has some sort of food compliance, whether it's FDA, Nestle, Swiss compliance. It needs to be indirect food contact safe. That's really important. And you need to make sure that you do a good job curing it. Uh, obviously, the telltale signs if it's under cured is that uh, the, the varnish would feel tacky coming out the other end of the hot air delivery, or you're starting to get blocking when you go to unwind that roll after you rewound it. That's a good indicator that you haven't fully cured that overprint varnish. Um, they're cost effective. Uh, it's a great way to go. Again, no capital equipment necessary. The, the biggest downside that we see to water-based overprint varnishes is it lacks mechanical resistance for the most part compared to lamination or e-beam coating. So if you did make pouches with that, you could have some scuffing and scratching depending on how tight those pouches are packed in the same box, how much they're moving around after they're filled, all those different things. So there's the downside of that type of finishing technique. So based off of what 
we just went through with all of those different finishing techniques. To us, it seems obvious, and hopefully to you now, that really the three best options for a label converter to move into flexible packaging uh, for finishing are e-beam coating, thermal lamination, or water-based overprint varnishes. Again, all of these have upsides and downsides that we went through, but these three seem to be the best and the self-wound pressure sensitive, the UV and the extrusion just kind of fall off of the options list because of those downsides that we recommended just seem to outweigh the upsides of them. Because that's how we see it, and hopefully that's how a lot of people see it, and we, we see that echo back to us because these are the finishing options that you see selected in the space today, uh, we offer these solutions to our customers. So we have our own e-beam solution called the Cat Pack e-beam. Uh, great for food, flexible packaging. One cool thing about e-beam that I didn't mention originally is that e-beam electron beams actually sterilize as you're curing your coating. So if for some reason a film got some sort of contaminant on it, um, the e-beam would actually sterilize that contaminant. So it's a, kind of an extra safety step that's just inherent in the e-beam process. Really cool stuff. Another cool thing about the e-beam solution is that it cross-links not only the coating on top, but it'll cross-link the inks underneath of it, adding way more heat resistance to those inks. Some inks just don't, well, will, when they're exposed to a ton of heat, will start to move and start to liquefy a little bit. You might, in that zipper crush area that I talked about, you might see some discoloration there, or some ink shifting there. That won't happen with e-beam as long as you're running at a high enough doses to cross-link those inks, which is really cool. So you're making the inks a lot more durable in and of themselves. And you're kind of taking that coating layer, your ink layer, and then that film layer, and you're cross-linking them all together to make it a bit of a homogenous, one big rock solid layer that can hold up to the, the stresses of hot fill. You could get into retort if you do it right and test it with e-beam, probably e-beam lamination versus e-beam coating. But E-beam allows you to get into markets that I think the other uh, finishing techni techniques wouldn't allow you to get into. There's an inherent sustainability with e-beam coating versus lamination as well, as you're eliminating your demand for plastics. Uh, typically, a pouch is a triplex structure. Let's say it's a metallized pouch. You'd have clear polyester, metallized polyester, and then your sealant layer. With e-beam coating, you could take that clear polyester completely out of it and replace it with coating. So your demand for plastic drops inherently by you're removing one third of the plastic layers out of your solution by offering e-beam. Also, it works great with compostable structures as well because compostable structures, they need to be consumed by the bugs in order to compost. By eliminating that layer, it's less for the bugs to have to consume and it increases the chance of that package actually composting in a home compost or an industrial composting plant, which is really cool. So if you're interested in e-beam, we have some great solutions. We can customize them for you, add slitting at the end, uh, do all types of different options. We have tons of drawings out there where we do e-beam on one side, and Gravier on the other and reverse it. I mean, the sky's the limit. We partner with a, a, a couple of different companies to help offer these e-beam solutions. So if that's something that you're interested in, we'd love to have that conversation with you. Uh, here's a quick video that we have on our e-beam solution. Uh, and I'll just narrate it for you. I'm not sure if the sound's gonna come through, so just bear with me. So again, this is our cat pack solution. Uh, the e-beam that we offer is provided by CT, PCT out of Davenport, Iowa. They create the actual e-beam unit itself and we build the unrind, rewind, flexo deck and everything around it. Um, again, it's offered in 30 inches. We're considering offering a narrower web like a 17 inch, but right now it's really stuck at the 30 inch to support that 20,000 and 25,000 platform. Uh, our e-beam solution has a compact footprint. It's typically about eight to 10 feet shorter than other manufacturers out there, which is really great. Runs really fast, 600 feet per minute. If your Indigo is running at 100 feet per minute, one e-beam can support up to 620,000, so 625,000 if that's your run speed, at least four or five comfortably. It's got amazing tension control. It can run pure polyethylene substrates that have a really low uh, tension rate of like, let's say seven pounds. We could run that 48 gauge polyester, no problem. 70 gauge polypropylene, no problem. So again, 
Really cool. It's got a simplistic HMI, so you can change all those tension settings and run settings on the fly, your dosage on the E-beam, and we'll help you and train you and do all that to make sure that when you get that E-beam installed, it's basically a turnkey solution for you, and it just runs great. Uh, I think that if you talk to anybody that had started that has started a digital flexible packaging factory as we like to call them that they would say that of all the pieces of equipment that they've installed that the e-beam was the simplest one to actually get up and running and, and lot, not a lot of headaches so moving on from our e-beam solution we're going to talk about a thermal lamination solution obviously carville's out there and they've got a great piece of equipment out there i've seen it run it runs great uh we really wanted to try to bring in a thermal laminator for the narrow web space so we have launched the the T14, which is a cell coat thermal laminator, and it's 14 inches. We actually have one of these in our demo site in Wisconsin. So if you're interested in getting a live demo on one of those, we'd love to show you how it runs. It's got, as you see, a crazy compact footprint. So no matter how crowded your shop floor is, there's gonna be room for this. You could definitely find space for it. Runs at 50 meters a minute, uh, which is about like 165 feet per minute. So it could keep up with a couple of different indigos. We have a, a cost-effective mod that can actually get it up to 100 meters per minute or about 330 feet, if my math is correct. Um, it's very cost effective uh, at the 14 inch space, but we also offer a 20 inch in case you had a 17 inch conventional press and you wanted to do lamination off both. We offer a 30 inch, obviously, to support the 20,000 uh, and 25,000 platforms, and we offer a 43 inch as well if you have something more in the mid range line of flexo presses that you wanted to offer thermal lamination. Uh, we could do inline slitting and duplex rewinding. All those different options are available on the cell coat. Uh, thermal laminator. We partner with Cellco out of the UK. They make a great product. Uh, oh, sorry. I hit the button again. So we have a quick video on that one. So bear with me. I'll get that started. Oh, started at the end. Okay. So here's our 30 inch model. This is an install that we, we basic uh, that we just recently uh, installed. So you see it has a Corona treater on there. So does our E-beam. That's super important, as most Indigo operators know, as far as getting good lamination bond strengths or coating adhesion. It does terminate a lot of headaches because it's really easy to use. You can see how small that is on the T14 model. Uh, you can run a variety of different substrates, polyesters, polyethylenes, soft touch, gloss, matte. Uh, it's got a real easy push button start. The HMI, you can actually load a bunch of presets. So if you run a typical construction, a lot of the time the operator could just create a, a preset in that HMI and just select it, hit the button, and away you go. And you know it's going to give you repeated results on that. Ooh, sorry about that. Didn't mean to pause the video. So we offer, of course, the thermal laminates that go with that. Uh, we're happy to supply you with those. And obviously with lamination and bearing the inks, you get a ton of scuff and scratch resistance. So if you're interested in learning more about that, please let us know. We'd love to help you out there. Okay. And then the last solution that we offer is obviously food contact or indirect food contact safe uh, varnishes, um, whether it's uh, gloss or matte, uh, that's not a problem. We have soft touch and we can actually tweak these varnishes and we love doing that. So we, with our varnishes, we try to mimic what the digital platform calls for, which is I want a custom varnish just for this one campaign. We'll do that. Most other coating suppliers will say, hey, we're happy to formulate a unique coating for you, but we're expecting you to buy, you know, 100,000 pounds of that coating a year for us to custom formulate. That's not how we operate with our uh, partner custom coatings out of Kentucky. Uh, we'll, we're happy to sell in gallons. We're happy to mix up one gallon or five gallon at a time and create a custom product for you that you only order once and never order it again. That's not a problem for us. We want to do that. We want to give uh, the flexible packaging converter or even label converters, whether it's rag cure for UV or E-beam, what have you, the ability to sell a specific coating just for a specific brand that nobody else can reproduce in the marketplace.
So again, no capital equipment necessary on these. You just have to be cognizant of your scratch resistance. Obviously, we're engineering these coatings to be as scratch resistant as possible, but they are food contact safe, they're nested compliant and Swiss compliant. So I think that sums up all the finishing methods. Uh, Here's some of the things that we can help you with on the on the e-beam solution. If you're familiar with the Jet FX, their uh, solo bar on the label finisher line from ABG, we offer that on our e-beam line as well. So you could do digital spot embellishment, digital cast and cure. Nobody, this is something that's unique to S1 labels and packaging. Nobody has a 30 inch print bar for e-beam and we offer that solution. And that's gonna be really cool and separate uh, the type of pouches that you could create from anybody else. You could do that cast and cure. You could do a lot of different things with it. And the spot embellishment is great from a digital side. You don't have to develop plates. Or if you're rotor gravier, you wouldn't have to buy a cylinder. You could do knockouts. You can leave windows. You could do a lot of great things with that print bar. And we're excited to be offering that to the market. Uh, obviously, if you get any of these uh, particular finishing options from us, you get favored nations pricing on films and coatings. Uh, we'll do film qualifications with you. If it's something that you haven't run before, or we haven't run before, we're happy to give you some free film and let you test that out and dial in those run settings while we're on site. Um, we have comprehensive financing options. Obviously, the e-beam we talked about is around a million dollars. So financing is probably necessary there. Uh, but even with the thermal laminator at the 30 inches, uh, maybe $200,000. We offer financing for that and the T14 as well, uh, which is the 14 inch model. Uh, we have global tech support and service. So we're all over the place. And we're happy to help you out. Um, we have the expertise. This is another thing that makes S1 labels and packaging a bit unique is that um, most equipment manufacturers only manufacture equipment and then you get your coatings or your laminates or your films from another manufacturer. Being that we offer the films and we offer the coatings and the equipment, there's no finger pointing if something goes wrong. It's like, oh, that was the coating's fine, that was the equipment's fault, or the film's fine, that was the equipment's fault, or vice versa. We offer all of them in a holistic package and we test and we retest and test again to make sure that these things all work in unison together. Right. It's kind of like the danger of one doctor prescribes you one medicine, another doctor prescribes you another. But do they know how those medicines are going to interact? That's what we're offering. We're taking that guessing game out of there. No bad reactions. Everything is designed to work and complement each other in this holistic approach. And then obviously we're doing this product and application development. Product development, we're coming out with new compostable structures and recyclable structures all the time. New coatings all the time that meet those standards that you need. Uh, so we're really trying to be on the leading edge and be a partner for you to get into this space and offer things that nobody else is doing and give you that competitive advantage over other label converters or flexible packaging converters uh, out there. And then just real quick, we have some D-scoop promotions going on right now. Uh, make sure you take advantage of these on the T14 laminator or any laminator, you get 5% off at six free rolls of material. On the E-beam, you get four free rolls of material. On qualifying overprint varnishes, we'll send you a free gallon of any single one of those to test. And then this goes out to anybody. Uh, if you're a new customer to labels and packaging, or if you're looking to test a new product from labels and packaging, uh, you get 10% off your first order of that product or your first order as a new customer. So that kind of wraps up everything as far as the finishing and the things that we offer. Uh, but just keep in mind, we're, we're, we love Michaelman. They're our partner on the primer. So if you have an Indigo, you're probably already sourcing from us already. And we'd love to give you that great supply chain on primer. But we try to be so much more than that. Uh, we offer the equipment, the films, coatings to have success. We offer that 30 inch print bar. We just try to give you everything that you need. And also, and this is one important thing that I left out is the know-how. If you're getting into digital flexible packaging for the first time, you might not know what barrier, what oxygen barrier, moisture barriers require for granola versus granola with nuts versus chocolate versus cannabis. We have that expertise and you can lean on us. And as a matter of fact, we can come in and do a lunch and learn once things are safe from a COVID standpoint, or we could do a virtual flex pack 101 for you and your sales team to give you that knowledge to go out there and sell with confidence that you're giving your customers a rock solid solution that's going to work in the field and, and answer their needs to have the best packaging out there in the market. The packaging is a brand's billboard. That's how they advertise. It's how they catch your eye in the, in the supermarket or at a store. So packaging is really important to them. And you have the tools already and with a partnership with S1LP to go out there and make those brands really stand out and, and make an impact in the space, whether it's sustainable or just eye-catching graphics. So uh, our contact information is here on the slide. So if you have any questions, please reach out. 
Uh, you can go on our website, s1lp.com to learn more. All these solutions are on there as well. Um, and I just wanted to thank everybody in the DC community for, for taking the time to listen to a little bit about how a label converter can get into the flexible packaging space and how hopefully we can help you do that in a great way. So uh, thank you again so much for your time. Uh, again, my name is Tom Hallenstein, and we hope to see you in DScoop Live uh, here soon coming in October. Thank you.